So we just saw a few tech companies go public. Instacart, Arm, Clavio. Yep. What's happening in the markets? Are we back or is this a blip? I think it's open for now. You know, for different types of companies, but you know, you see IPO markets like an accordion. I think there were like 400 plus deals in 21 and 40 and 22, and I think something like 50 or 60 this year. You know, obviously, interest rates change a lot. What how people value it, whether they go public, the value of cash flows or earnings and cash counts a little bit more than it counted before. But for now, it's open. Markets are healthy. You know, the economy is still okay, so uh, it's it's open. Maybe not for everybody, but it's open. Given we're in London. You don't see the same wealth of tech companies that you see in, in Silicon Valley. They want more big yeah. star tech companies yeah. here. Why haven't we seen that? Yeah, I think it's the, I'd look at it the other way around. U.S. was the center of tech, you know, not just Silicon Valley. It's all over America. I recently came from, you know, Boise and other places. It, it's staggering. Mm -hmm. But so the diaspora has actually moved overseas. You have some, I was recently in Berlin and Paris. There are tech startups everywhere now. They're quite good. They're more of a going public. You know, and we're the leader of taking them public here, so I think it's a great thing. And obviously, you've, already, you've always had it in China, a little bit in India. Still, it's not in the Europe, it's not quite like the United States, but the fact that it's here is a very good thing. JP Morgan's tech footprint has gotten even bigger now that we've seen clients flood out of SVB. You bought yeah. First Republic. How big is the opportunity to be yeah. the new incumbent bank yeah. for startups and VCs? And, and how will you, Jamie Dimon, manage the risk differently? Yeah. I think, first of all, we didn't want to benefit in the world by that kind of thing happening. So it wasn't good for banks or good for us. Having said that, when that happened, you know, we had people working around the clock, literally, to open those accounts. I recently came from a Sequoia thing. I know a lot of the venture capitalists, you know, Saturday, Sundays, through the nights to, you know, to onboard these accounts and help them through it. And, uh, you know, one of the great lessons, and we always were there. We always did okay. I always wanted to do better. Uh, we're going to, we're adding people. I think the biggest difference in Silicon Valley Bank, before I get to First Republic, is you know, they did a great job at some of this stuff. Yeah. So obviously there's certain things they did on a macro level which weren't right. They did a lot of things at the micro level that were right. How they dealt with the client, how they serviced them, they serviced them locally. So we have unbelievable products and services to bring to them. Digital, consumer, subscription lines, financing, globality, research, you name it. But we have to deliver it to them in a way they actually like it and they want it which is what Silicon Valley Bank did. So we're organizing around it. If you speak to a bunch of people here, you hear them talk about, you know, we're adding, we just took out a whole bunch of new space in Palo Alto. We hired John Chin, who's one of the top people of Silicon Valley mm -hmm. Bank, uh, organized around the in, uh, innovation economy. We'll get it right. Mm -hmm. I just want to make sure they're happy with us a year from now, mm -hmm. not just, just today. But what and, about and we're already a leader. It, it's, that's what we do all day long. It's not, it's, it's for us, it's incremental risk. It's a slightly different kind of risk. So, you know, and this happened years ago, that would a bank lend to a non-revenue company? Well, the answer, you know, 20 years ago was zero, but we did Facebook. Mm -hmm. So we've learned how you can do that, when you do that. Uh, but uh, again, the risk is, it's not the risk, it's the venture capital company, it's the venture capital partners, mm -hmm. it's the, then the, their investee companies, it's the investee companies' managements, it's that whole ecosystem, and so we're just organizing around it. You've got a top-notch group investigating AI, what are they up to? What's the next level of finance you think AI yeah. can unlock? Yeah. So I think the most important thing is that it's, AI is real. We already have thousands of people doing it. Top scientists around the world, Manuel Velosa, from, who ran Carnegie Mellon Machine Learning. Uh, and it's a living, breathing thing. So people want to answer, what's it going to do? It's a living, breathing thing. It's going to change. There are going to be all different types of models and different types of tools and technology. But the, the way to think about it for us is every single process so errors, trading, hedging, research, every app, every database, you're going to be applying AI. So it might be as a co-pilot. It might be to replace humans. Like, you know, AI is doing all the equity hedging for us hmm. for the most part. It's idea generation. It's large language models. It's note taking while you're talking to someone. And while it's taking notes, it may actually say to you that, you know, here's the thing of interest. The client might be interested in all error, all customer service. It's a little bit of everything. But it is and going so, to replace some jobs. Of course, yeah. But I, I, look, folks, pe people have to take a deep breath, okay? Technologies always, repl always replace jobs. Your children are going to live to 100 and not have cancer because mm -hmm. of technology. And literally, they'll probably be working three and a half days a week. So technology has done unbelievable things for mankind. But, you know, planes crash, pharmaceuticals get misused. There are negatives. This one, the biggest negative, in my view, is AI being used by bad people to do mm -hmm. bad things. Think of cyber. You know, Henry Kissinger talks about uh, warfare. Uh, but, you know, the fact, and I do think, you know, eventually you have legal guardrails around it. It's kind of hard to do because it's new, uh, but it will add a huge value. 
And you know, for J.P. Morgan, if it replaces jobs, you know, we hope to redeploy people. Mm -hmm. Like at First Republic, you know, we've offered jobs to like 90% of the people. They accepted. Uh, but we also, you know, we've told them as we some of those jobs are transitory. But we hire 30,000 people a year. So right. we expect to be able to get them a job somewhere local in a different branch or a different function if we can do that. So, and we'll be doing that with any dislocation that takes place as a, as a result of AI. I want the Jamie Dimon forecast on the broader economy. Yeah. First it was hurricanes and then it was storm clouds in your yeah. annual letter. Now, What's the weather now? You, you, Is you, a recession You guys coming? have consistently got this wrong, <laughs> okay? I'm not giving a forecast. I'm, I'm trying to, I, 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 I blame myself, okay? The U.S. has been very strong for a while. No surprise, $5 trillion was pump, pumped in fiscally, you know, $3 trillion to $4 trillion of QE, and now that's being reversed. The consumer's still in good shape. They're still spending money. They still have more money than pre-COVID. It's spending down. Home prices have gone for 15 years. Asset prices have gone for 15 years. They're in pretty good shape. Mm -hmm. And then the people are talking about, you know, deterioration. Credit is not deteriorating. Credit card, all-time highs, not inflation-adjusted or GDP-adjusted or income-adjusted. And yeah, it's, it's deteriorating. We thought it was normalizing. And corporate credit's been quite good. So you have a strong economy. That's the here and now. Mm -hmm. all, and all the data is a little distorted because of COVID and things like that. When you ask the question about a forecast, and I don't make forecasts, I look out there and say, what are the range of outcomes? From hurricane to storm clouds. No, this is, I would put it as several storm clouds. I said, when I said hurricane, I was correcting. Someone said the storm, cl storm clouds dissipate. I said, no, that one may be a hurricane. Mm -hmm. We don't know what it is. Here's what they are. There are two of them that are different than other things. So we always have, you know, I don't worry about the weather. And I honestly, I don't spend a lot of time guessing about the economy. I mean, that, that to me is, is the sunny or rainy. Or, I don't worry about that. We run the company to serve clients through thick and thin. That's what we do, to serve governments, to, you know, satisfy our regulators. And that, that's all weather. But there are two things which are extraordinary today, which may have different outcomes, and think of them as storm clouds. We don't know if they're going to hit, when they're going to hit, what they're going to do. Okay, so I'm not predicting that, but I'll tell you what I worry about. So one is the fiscal money being spent is so big, largest in uh, peacetime ever, America and kind of around the world, with already very high deficits. Mm -hmm. And QT we've never had. So I know some people think QT will be uneventful. I'm not so sure. I, at a minimum, I expect volatile markets. Uh, and then you've got, uh, and then all the long-term fiscal things are kind of inflationary. You know, oil prices, certain commodity prices, the green economy, you know, the restructuring of trade, you name it, I see it's adding to inflation, not mm -hmm. subtracting inflation. So I don't think inflationary will, will be that, you know, keep on coming down. It may not. And therefore, rates may go higher. But the biggest storm cloud is geopolitical. It's Ukraine, the humanitarian crisis. You know, it's a war not far from here. It's along 600 miles, 500,000 people have been killed. It's nuclear blackmail. It's going to affect all global relationships in America and China, trade alliances. We don't know how it's going to start either. So I just put those two things as I keep a close eye on. And then how it affects the economy is different. And what I've been talking about that is, I just tell people, be prepared for higher rates and slower 7%. growth. Seven percent. Are we really going there? And, well, and how does I don't know. That when I said five percent, they said, are we going there? Yeah, it's possible. You know, so I, when I talk to my board, I say, yeah, it, it, can it go to seven percent? The answer is yes. Are there factors that would drive it, you know, higher than, you know, where it is today? You know, four and a half, four, six or four, seven. I'm talking about a 10-year bond now. Mm -hmm. Yes. Uh, is supply and demand could push high? Yes. I'm, I'm just saying be prepared for it. So and, uh, and, and, and then the worst case is stagflation. Mm -hmm. You know, higher rates because you have a booming economy and there's a lot of competition for capital is not the same thing as stagflation. What are, what are the ripple effects of the stress of that? 7% rates on business, on your growth? Well, I'm not worried about J.P. Morgan. J.P. Morgan, you know, we, we're, we are prepared. We can handle 7%. Mm -hmm. We can handle 2% again. 8%? Yeah, we can handle that too. Mm -hmm. I mean, that's, I mean, that's, that risk management is not the same thing as guessing the future. Mm -hmm. When risk managers look at the range of potential outcomes and being able to say to yourself, we can handle this, we can handle this, we don't really expect it, and we can handle the in-between. You know, if you bet your company on, you know, one outcome, so I think all companies do that. You know, and every company's got different exposures, you know, input prices, output prices. You know, some interest rates don't matter. Some it's the price of mozzarella. So, you know, <laughs> what's your business? Your business is different. So, uh, but I, I think we don't know the effect of these things in the economy. So they may... We may have a soft landing, we may have a mild recession, we may have a harder recession. You know, obviously there are potential bad outcomes. The, you know, the worst one would be economically is stagflation, right. where you have low growth, 
high interest rates. And obviously, if that happens, you're going to see you know, a lot of people struggling. Where's China on the list of risks? Oh, I, when I say geopolitical, that's the big one. Mm -hmm. it's, the, it's, the, it's the threat from Ukraine, oil and gas, food, migration, all our relationships, the most important one being China. Mm -hmm. That is the most important for the future of the world. Uh, and, and obviously, Ukraine is affecting it. And in fact, it's very hard to see really positive outcomes with China until the Ukraine war is resolved. Hopefully, uh, whether Ukrainians could say they have a victory of some sort. You said you're worried about another Trump presidency. How worried? I don't know if I've said that. I, I, I'm, I'm hoping the American public, I, we, look, we need good American leadership. And I think that we need to explain to people why this is so important for the world. You know, and so there's a little bit of this, you know, America first and, you know, no American president is going to say America second. But, but what we need to explain is why Ukraine is important to us and why American security relies on global security and why our allies rely on that. And if they can't rely on, on America, they will have to rely on someone else. And so I just think it's very important. You know, Bob Gates writes in his book, The Exercise of Power, about the symphony of power. And it's all the soft things, not the military, which we've overused, but diplomacy, development, finance, education, communication, uh, all, and uh, obviously economic, trade, mm -hmm. investment, all those things. And I think we need a better job in that. We just avoided a, another U.S. government shutdown. Now there's talks of a McCarthy ouster. Do you have a message for anyone in Congress? Look, I, we need good policymakers. You know, a shutdown is a bad idea. I'm, I'm grateful they came up with a solution. You know, democracies, by their nature, mean compromise. That's what a democracy is. Mm -hmm. So I, and there are a lot, when I go to Washington, you know, you see on the press all the time the bad parts. There are also some great Congress folks, great senators who want to get things done in the interest of the United States. Uh, and I'm glad they did this particular one. Of course, you know, 40 days, 45 days from now. And, you know, Kevin McCarthy is the Speaker of the House, and I wish him the best. Mm -hmm. I've known him for many years. Uh, uh, and he's got a tough hand. Mm. He's, he's, he's got a tough hand, but he's doing okay so far. <laughs> Regulators have proposed new capital rules that yeah. banks have said will make it tougher for yeah. Americans to get a mortgage. But I'm curious, when you look across the firm, what businesses are going to have the biggest impact? How, break it down. For, first of all, it's a, it's a hundred page, a thousand pages long. So you have to go <laughs> by product, by service, by country, by cross border, by type, uh, and then this operational risk thing. So, you know, we're. You know, I don't think it's all the right stuff. I don't, I don't think it's very comprehensive or well thought through. But let them do what they want at this point. And nor is it international. So you may not know if you're an American, we have to have 30% more capital than European mm -hmm. banks, the way it's currently constructed. Mm -hmm. What happened to the international requirements? Mm -hmm. Like, weren't we supposed to like international level playing fields and all stuff like that? When you get into the specifics, it really matters how the ultimate rules about mortgages and small business loans, et cetera. In general, you know, it makes, like, you know what I don't like about it, for example? It punishes diversification, operating risk capital, and GCIFI. And diversification is one of the true free lunches for a bank that protects it. And I don't understand why they do that. And I just, you know, we're, we're going to be responding. Hopefully, it'll be modified and, uh, and thoughtfully done for international purposes. And mostly, you know, America's got the best financial system the world's ever seen. And, you know, that includes hedge funds and private equity and private capital, all things like that. But this is, you know, I say that private equity hedge funds are dancing in the streets. And this time, they're being quite public about it. Because this is going to push a lot of stuff out of the banking system. And if that's what the regulators want, so be it. Is that good for America? I don't know. We've gone from 7,300 public companies in 1996 to 4,500 today. Mm -hmm. Is that what we wanted? It should have been 14,000. Did you want a lot of credit to move private? You know, maybe they did. And you know, then they accomplished their goals. The biggest tech companies prop up a huge chunk of the S&P. Is big tech too big to fail? I think that's a too broad a question. You know, I, I think in any industry, uh, well, when you say too big to fail, which I, I've lost touch with what that really means anymore, because remember, car companies were bailed out, and these things were bailed out, and, mm -hmm. you know, I, I don't understand. They should ask what they want. If the regulars don't want a bank to ever fail again, then we should do A, B, C, D, and E, mm -hmm. if that's the goal. I didn't think that was the goal. I think Dodd-Frank actually accomplished most of the goals, which is dramatically reduce the risk, create liquidity, capital, stuff like that. So, and big tech, you've got to be very specific. You know, sometimes companies misuse their position, and sometimes they don't. Sometimes regulators capture it, and sometimes they don't. You know, we, but they're, they're powerful, you know, and we, we have to deal with that. I've been writing about, you know, big tech 
going to our business, we've got FinTech, but we also have Big Tech. Mm -hmm. And they will embed payment systems in there. And some are going to white label banks, kind of what Apple did. Uh, you know, they have the right to do that. I'm not against that. I would be against unfair use of their position to dominate us in a business. Well, Apple um, is, is going deeper into financial services. No do you question. worry about the bank of Apple? I wrote about it. I wrote about it like five years ago. You know, well, how like, worried what, are you now? Like, what is a bank? Well, I'm, I, we're going to compete, so they have, a, they have a tough competitor, but, you know, they hold money, move money. Uh, they, you could put money in a basically, you know, markets, but it's a white-labeled uh, checking account, credit card, uh, you know, all these things. Yeah, they're a form of a competitor. You know, we also partner with them, but I'm very used to partnering and competing with lots of people. You know. Existential threat? I don't think it's an existential threat, but I think if we were complacent about it, yes. Jamie Dimon, uh, we're here to talk about tech. I'll see you on stage. Jamie Dimon, Chair and CEO of JP Morgan. Thank you.